Uh, my name is David Swanson. I'm the director of World Beyond War, and I will be moderating together with Greta Zaro, who is the organizing director of World Beyond War. We have uh, four wonderful speakers who will each be speaking briefly, and then we will have discussion, questions, and answers. And you will be able to ask your questions in the chat at any time, and we will get to them as rapidly as possible when we get to that Q&A section, uh, you'll also be able to use the raise hand feature, clicking where it says raise hand. Uh, sometimes you have to click participants and then raise hand, uh, and we will be calling on you uh, as soon as we get to that section. Uh, I'll, I'll introduce our speakers uh, one at a time as we get to them. They are going to be Hussein Abdullah, Ali Mushaima, Medea Benjamin, and Barbara Ween. Uh, and we will be starting with Hussein. Hussein, unfortunately, has a family emergency and will not be able to stay through the question and answers, but has been good enough to nonetheless take part. Uh, and we're going to let him speak first. Uh, he also is the principal uh, energy behind creating this webinar. Uh, Hussein Abdullah is originally from Bahrain. He's the founder and executive director of Americans for democracy and human rights in Bahrain. As executive director, Hussein leads the organization's efforts to ensure that US policies support democracy and human rights movements in Bahrain. Hussein also works closely with members of the Bahraini American community to ensure that their voices are heard by US government officials and the broader US public. Hussein Abdullah, welcome. Well, uh, thank you, David. Let me begin by uh, thanking you personally and thanking World Beyond War for organizing this and helping us greatly to have this uh, uh, event and this great turnout. I also am honored to uh, 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 share the panel, I guess a virtual panel with uh, Medea, Barbara and Ali. Uh, I know all of them personally and a special note to Ali. Uh, it's an honor to be on a panel with you. Ali is a uh, Victor, a survivor of, of uh, torture. His family really paid uh, a heavy price for their activism. His father is the leader of the political opposition in Bahrain, Mr. Hassan Mushema, and him, Ali, and his uh, uh, several of his siblings were arrested as a reprisal for their father activities and for their own activism. So I'm happy to be here. Unfortunately, I will not be able to stay due to uh, some uh, issues beyond uh, my control, like David said, family emergency. So I'm gonna use these uh, few minutes that I have to give you an overview of what happened 10 years ago on February 14th, uh, uh, 2011. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, to, toward the beginning of 2011, uh, uh, to end of 2010, beginning of 2011, several countries in the region had their uprising demanding for democracy, human rights, justice, rule of law, uh, uh, ruled by the people, ending the autocratic regimes in these countries. Uh, we had, we've seen movements in Egypt, Tunisia, and uh, Tunisia and other countries in the region. Bahrain, no different, uh, had their own chapter uh, of Arab Spring. So on February 14th, 2011, the people of Bahrain decided to protest uh, peacefully, demanding uh, deep, uh, rooted, uh, deep rooted uh, uh, changes, political changes in the country. Uh, Bahrain is a small island. Uh, the population is, is hardly uh, uh, a million. Uh, we had more than half of the population uh, uh, came to the street demanding peaceful change. The reaction from the government, unfortunately, was severe. Uh, 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 extrajudicial killing, mass arrest, arbitrary detention, depriving people of their liberty, uh, 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 torture while, while, while in uh, uh, prison, uh, deploying uh, Bahraini, not only Bahraini police, but also the army, the military, to face uh, civilians. However, that did not stop the people from continuing their march. Uh, because of the large number uh, of people protested, we've seen some, uh, we've seen the government stop the violence for a short period of time, where people actually continued their effort to basically uh, go through the peaceful change. Like I said, Ali's father at that time was going through cancer treatment in, in London. He left that and came back to Bahrain and led the protest and the demand uh, uh, peacefully in the country. The Al Khalifa government 
uh, 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 called their allies in the Gulf to support them. So uh, in, in Bahrain, when it comes to military intervention, probably one of the few countries that you had foreign troops come in the country, uh, organize military from a government. We're not talking about a mili militia. We're talking about actual government, GCC government, which is Bah uh, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, came, uh, marched into Bahrain to crush the peaceful uh, uh, protest. That led into also mass human rights violations, thousands of political uh, uh, prisoners, a military court were uh, uh, established to basically uh, uh, prosecute or persecute civilians and political leaders and human rights defenders. My dear colleague Medea actually was in Bahrain, and of course, I'm, I'm certain she will uh, be talking about her experience there. Because of these mass human rights violations, Bahrain allies, United States and UK, and some other Western government uh, 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 through uh, behind scene diplomacy, pressured Bahrain to create something called the Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry, the BICI, which basically was, uh, you can call it a semi-fact-finding mission at that time. We're still talking in 2011. The, this commission or this commission of inquiry uh, was led by uh, the late professor Sharif Basuni, who's well known, a renowned international scholar in international law, a professor at DePaul University in Chicago. He led that investigation for a few months. So, uh, timeline in February, you had the uprising, the pro democracy movement, the revolution to basically demand uh, a democratic and democratization in Bahrain. In November 2011, Sharif Basuni came with his report called the BICI, and he had several findings in that report. One of the most important findings is, and that's important for when it comes to US policy, Sharif Basuni, an independent scholar, made it clear in his report that this uprising in Bahrain, this democratic movement in Bahrain is indigenous, it's local, has nothing to do with any foreign forces, especially Iran, because the government always claim, always attach any pro-democracy movement, any democratization process or call for political change to Iran. In other, way, in other words, it's the boogeyman to scare the West for any kind of political change in Bahrain. Also, Sharif Basuni in this report, BICI, found that the Bahraini government committed crimes of human rights when it comes to arbitrary detention, depriving people of liberty, sexual attack, sexual uh, uh, attack inside prison, torture, extrajudicial killing, and other score of human rights violations. It also came up with some recommendation. There were 27 or 28 excellent recommendation uh, uh, in this report. If the Bahraini government would have followed those recommendation, we will be in a different place today. I'm not saying that was a perfect report, but we will not be today where we still have thousands of political prisoners and a score of uh, ongoing systematic human rights violations. When it comes to U.S. action or, or congressional action, the BICI was a report that Congress was looking at to basically see if Bahrain is going to take the right track. During that time, we had President Obama, of course, and, and the current president at that time was the former president, uh, former vice president, uh, uh, Joe Biden. Uh, uh, Congress requested at least on three different occasions from the State Department to basically assess Bahrain's implementation on the BICI. The State Department on in one of its reports clearly made it that clearly stated that Bahrain has not implemented overwhelming majority of these recommendations. And those which were recommended, which were few, we can count them in one hand, Bahrain have backtracked on uh, uh, those recommendations as well. A, a question, and, and I'll conclude where we are today. We are basically living uh, uh, in a country that is run by, uh, uh, it's a basically a police state. You get arrested and you get uh, thrown in prison for years because of a tweet. Imagine, because of a tweet where you criticize a government, you get thrown in jail. We have a well-known human rights defender, Mr. Nabir Rajab, the president of Bahrain Center for Human Rights. He spent years in prison because of a tweet where he criticized the war in Yemen. We have other human rights defenders, uh, Ibtisam al a woman human rights defender who have been uh, tortured, sexually attacked, raped when she was in, in, in prison in Bahrain. She has been arrested because she has 
participated in the Human Rights Council, because she has talked about torture, because she has documented the human rights violations. Another woman human rights defenders uh, 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 went through the same experience, Najah Youssef, because she has criticized Formula One in Bahrain, because she has documented the human rights violations. I can go on and on about cases of civilians, uh, members of the civil society, activists who have been tortured, arrested, ill-treated because of this, because of their uh, uh, peaceful uh, uh, human rights uh, activities. This is not only the reporting of ADHRB or Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International or the Bahrain Institute for Rights and Democracy or NGO within Bahrain. It is actually the working group on, on arbitrary, arbitrary detention of the United Nation or the special rapporteur on freedom of expression or the special rapporteur on uh, human rights defenders and other experts of the human rights of the United Nation uh, uh, special procedures or the experts of the United Nation. Also the committee on uh, committee against torture, a United Nation committee against torture in its recommendation and finding have found that Bahrain uh, 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 practiced torture toward uh, 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 activists and opposition. With that, I would like to conclude that we have an opportunity right now with this new administration who clearly stated that foreign policy, the US foreign policy will have a space, a significant space for human rights and democracy. So let's Bahrain be the test. We have many uh, uh, participants in this call who support progressive values, support a foreign policy, for the United States that basically end its uh, military support and its economic support to autocratic regimes uh, and autocratic ruler. Well, Al Khalifa is the best example of those uh, uh, bad regime that continue violating uh, uh, the indigenous, uh, violating the rights of the indigenous people uh, of Bahrain. So with that, again, I would like to thank you, David, and I'm extremely sorry that I could not continue uh, the program with you. Thank you, uh, Hussein. Very much appreciated. I see people uh, clapping, uh, although they're muted. Um, let's go to our second uh, speaker, uh, whose name is not IMAC, uh, but that's what you'll you'll see on the screen there. Uh, Ali Mushaima. I hope I'm pronouncing that close enough to, to accurately. Uh, Ali is a political activist based in London. He is the uh, son of Hassan Mushaima. Hassan Mushaima is an opposition leader in Bahrain and the secretary general of the Haq movement, an important opposition party in Bahrain. Before forming Haq, he was a founding member of all WIFAC and a leading figure in the 1994 uprising in Bahrain. He has campaigned for more democratic rights in Bahrain and has been in prison there since his arrest in 2011. His son, our, our guest and speaker, Ali Mushaima, is stateless as the Bahraini authorities revoked his citizenship and sentenced him in absentia to 45 years in prison. We are very glad he is not in prison. He has carried out a hunger strike to try to save his father who has severe medical conditions for which the Bahraini authorities continue to deny adequate treatment. Ali, uh, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to address you all today. Uh, I would like to start by acknowledging and honoring all those who have been prosecuted for voicing their political views and beliefs. The question that I am addressing during this talk is, why is it said that although revolution is necessary, the continuation of the revolution is of even greater importance? It is important to note here that the fight for democracy in Bahrain has been ongoing for nearly 100 years. Since 1938 and before, we have been campaigning and demanding widespread reforms, democratic political participation, and to end the persecution of Bahrainis. We have been demanding a peaceful transition to democracy. However, the political climate in Bahrain has grown increasingly hostile over the past decades. By 2010, the Al Khalifa regime controlled large parts of the country through the barges and privatization of land, while at the same time, living conditions were deteriorating for many Bahrainis and government repression 
on uh, free speech had increased significantly. Behind the facade of a parliament and general election, hundreds of people were being imprisoned for expressing uh, their political views. The ruling elite began to rely more heavily on silencing opposition voices uh, in order to suppress these demands for reform. Unsurprisingly, this situation boiled over into a series of protests during the Arab Spring of 2011. Uh, during this period, the Bahraini people were hopeful for change. Large group of people came together in anger over widespread repression, the denial of uh, freedom of expression, sectarian discrimination, the privatization of land for the benefit of the ruling family, and the imprisonment of opposition activists and uh, leaders. Unfortunately, repression has only become more widespread. This shows that the mentality of the ruling Al Khalifa family has not changed. And that change will not be realized unless the people persist in their struggle for democracy, quality, and dignity. The cause of the Arab Spring still remains to this day. In fact, the very issues uh, that instigated the 2011 protests have only worsened uh, uh, in the decade since. Following the revolution, the need for deep-rooted uh, change has become even more critical, and these are uh, the reasons. Firstly, people have murdered uh, on the street, including Isa Abdel Hassan, Isa Ar-Radi, Bahia Al-Aradi, Abdel Rasul Hijari, and many others. Secondly, prisoners have been tortured to death, such as Ali Sagar, Hassan Jassim, Zakaria Al-Ashiri, Karim Fakhrawi, and others like Muhammad Mshamir, Muhammad Sahwan, Ja'far Durazi, and many have lost their life due to intentional lack of medical care in a prison. Third, mosques and worship houses have been attacked and destroyed in a significant shift in the level of violation against the people of Bahrain by Al Khalifa regime. Fourth, women and children are being arrested, tortured, and convicted on trumped up charges. This is a new tactic uh, that the regime are employing. It infringes on the rights of women and children. Fifth, occupation. In this period, period we have been invited by Saudi and UAE troops to crush the revolution, which has not happened in our recent history. King citizenship, the regime used this tactic against opposition activists. Seventh, denying, denying the right uh, to freedom of religion, sectarian discrimination has become normalized as a part of, uh, of the official government uh, policy in the country. Eighth, uh, the use of death penalty against oppos opposition activists. Even when it has been proved, they are innocent job uh, owners and even pensioners' rights have been taken away. Despite this, members of ruling family have continued to prosper and increase their personal worth during this, uh, this time buying a sports club in Europe and hosting a global uh, sports events such as Formula One uh, and use these to, to whitewash uh, their crimes. As you can see, there is uh, even more a need to continue the revolution of 2011. The regime has clearly shown that they are unwilling to change. They are not open to serious reform and the corruption that they have institutionalized will take a long time to eradicate it. Bahrain's allies will come to realize over time that they were wrong for supporting the regime. Eventually, the will of the people and their dreams of a better life for future generation will prevail over the military and economic might of the regime. The people have given the ultimate sacrifices and we are at the point and only we can move forward toward establishing democracy to honor our martyrs. History teach us that we will prevail. 
I would like, uh, finally, I would like to make one recommendation to the new administration in the White House, the Biden administration. We never called for an intervention in our country from any government. And we can certainly continue the struggle to establish democracy and the human rights in Bahrain. What we would like to see uh, is from the United States to stop interfering in Bahrain and to stop supporting the Al Khalifa dictatorship. Once the US stop its immoral support to the Al Khalifa regime, then I can assure you, we will have a different Bahrain. Bahrain with no political prisoners, Bahrain with no human rights violation, Bahrain with no women human rights defenders in a prison, Bahrain where freedom of expression is protected and, uh, and respected, Bahrain with no fear, Bahrain, with, uh, demo Bahrain that is democratic. My message to Mr. Biden, stop supporting dictators. Thank you very much. Uh, I see that I'm muted. Uh, very well said. Uh, and I see people cheering who are also muted, as I was, uh, and you can't hear them. Uh, we will get to uh, questions and answers shortly. The wonderful questions are coming in on the chat. Put more there. Uh, our next speaker, we are very privileged uh, to have with us, Medea Benjamin, who is co-founder of the women-led peace group Code Pink and co-founder of the human rights group, Global Exchange. She is also a member of World Beyond Wars advisory board and gives us great advising. She has been an advocate for social justice for more than 40 years. She has also been to Bahrain and I believe had the honor of being kicked out of that country. Uh, Medea Benjamin, welcome, go ahead. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's wonderful to be on with uh, so many people and so many young people. I don't know, Barbara, are those your students? <laughs> Yes, great, fantastic. Yes. And uh, Ali, it's a great privilege to be with you and my heart goes out to you and your family that continue to suffer so much uh, from the repression of this government. And I'm so sorry we lost Hussein because I was looking forward to uh, learning from him, which we did in the opening. Uh, and I wanted to hear more from him in the questions because you, Ali and Hussein are our real experts in this. Um, I remember Hussein getting me in trouble after I got back from, uh, from Bahrain. He called me and said, there was a big event happening, a celebration at the uh, Bahraini embassy. You've got to go inside and confront the ambassador with all of these photos from Amnesty International about torture. And I said, uh, okay, whatever you say. Uh, so he gave me the, the pictures. I went inside and I spread them out all over this fancy uh, uh, dining area and um, the you know, security comes running in and the ambassador who's a woman comes running in and says, no, 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 this is false. This isn't true. We don't torture. And I said, well, here's the evidence right here. And this is Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, all these, you know, credible organization. She comes and she puts her arms around me and she, uh, her arm and she says, dear, dear, if we tortured, it was only a little. So that was... Um, Hussein getting me in trouble and kicked out of the Bahraini embassy. But um, when I went to Bahrain, it was one year after the uh, original uprising. And it was such a, an, uh, an honor to be able to get in and talk to these activists who weren't in prison. Of course, I couldn't talk to the ones in prison. And uh, I do have to say that it was difficult to get in. We had a delegation and each one of us had to go in separately and make up a story about why we were going to Bahrain because they wouldn't let in human rights observers. They wouldn't let in journalists. And um, some of our delegation got in saying they were going to a bachelor's party because Bahrain was a place where many Saudis and others go to be able to drink and party. And, uh, and um, uh, that worked for some of us. Uh, uh, we, um, some people never got through the airport and got deported. And uh, I had the great honor of being housed at the home of uh, uh, Nabil Rajab from the um, Human Rights Center and uh, to see his work and the work of those people and so many of the others we met was just remarkable. In fact, um, we spent the first days going around to meet with people who had been arrested and tortured a year earlier 
uh, during the uprising. And many of the people we met with were uh, doctors and nurses who had been arrested merely because at their hospitals, uh, people had been attacked, shot, uh, were coming streaming into the hospitals and they were attending to them. And for that, they were arrested. And people would pull up their pants legs or show us on their back uh, their wounds from the torture. Uh, it was um, uh, a, a harrowing experience to be there because um, uh, the repression was something that I wasn't prepared for. Uh, everywhere we went, we were followed and um, you saw the evidence of US weapons everywhere, the armored tanks constantly, we were being tear gassed because we were with uh, activists. And I've never, um, I, I've never seen so much tear gas. In fact, if you went into the suburbs, every evening people would get out on their rooftops to say, uh, down, down with the regime. Uh, on the highways, there would be honking, honk, 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 you know, to, to be saying it uh, without saying it. And immediately um, they would be attacked with uh, tear gas, uh, stun grenades, sound grenades, uh, we were trying to make it to the what's called the Pearl Roundabout. And you know, Ali, uh, they destroyed the statue in the Pearl Roundabout as part of the crushing of the uprising the year earlier, but it still is a symbol physically. And so as part of marking the one year anniversary, which by the way, is for us on Valentine's Day, February 14th, um, we tried to make our way down to the Pearl Roundabout the activists had dressed those of us who got in up, um, uh, covered up so you couldn't see that we were foreigners. Uh, and also in our, um, uh, with, they put uh, tear gas masks uh, in our clothing so we would be ready. Uh, and indeed, we didn't even get down close to the Pearl Roundabout um, before the tear gas started. And when I say tear gas, I've been tear gassed in many countries around the world, including my own. Uh, in, in Bahrain, they used the tear gas canisters as a weapon and they would aim them right at us. Uh, and we would be dodging not only the tear gas, but the canisters themselves, which have killed people and, and, and really uh, uh, wounded them gravely. Um, the, uh, uh, the um, everyday uh, people who are in our delegation were getting picked up and deported just for being witnesses. And uh, I lasted until the last of our delegation when I was asked by the women, uh, could we go with them? There were two of us left, two women uh, for a, uh, a march. And all of these marches you have to understand are totally nonviolent, trying to get as close as we could to the Pearl Roundabout. And we said, sure, and we dressed up and put our, uh, our, our tear gas masks uh, in our clothing. And as soon as we got within, I would say four blocks uh, walking, uh, we were totally surrounded uh, by tanks. Uh, they had water cannons, they had stun grenades, sound grenades, uh, and all hell broke loose. And um, the women scattered and I was picked up and uh, held and then uh, deported. I must say with each one getting us deported, uh, the US Embassy did absolutely nothing except make sure we were deported. Uh, and I say this because it's an example of how the US uh, has been siding with the regime over the human rights activists and the legitimate uh, grievances. And those legitimate grievances, as both Hussein and Ali have said, uh, are to have a modicum of democracy. In fact, um, at the beginning, it was just to ask for a constitutional monarchy, not even be saying down, down with the regime. But as the repression got worse, uh, it became an issue of uh, the regime itself. Uh, and uh, also, as Hussein talked about uh, Iran being the boogeyman, uh, we saw that when we were there, uh, that there were so many uh, attempts to try to paint the activists as being somehow egged on by Iran, uh, and also to put it in sectarian terms. And even though the Shia are the majority of people in uh, Bahrain, uh, they are not the only ones who have been trying to bring democracy. We met with progressive Sunnis, we met with secular people, 
Uh, and all of them have said, we want uh, equal rights for everyone. Um, in in the, um, the US has consistently showed that it is more concerned about keeping the Fifth Fleet uh, stationed there, the Naval Forces Central Command stationed there, um, and originally uh, US access to oil in the Persian Gulf, uh, which is not so much of an issue anymore because we don't need that oil. Uh, but it, it is, uh, has also been key for uh, US invasions in the region. And the Bahraini government has been only too willing to accommodate uh, the US in giving them the land for the bases, uh, the ports, and the rights to use the airspace as well for US pilots that have been using Bahrain as a launching pad uh, for things like the Gulf War in 91, uh, the invasion of Iraq in 2003, the invasion of Afghanistan itself as well. And uh, Bahrain uh, with symbolic um, to show its allegiance to the United States, uh, throwing in some of the weapons that it bought from the United States, sometimes a, a couple of hundred uh, troops um, to participate in these actions. Uh, the latest one being Yemen where it is really shameful that Bahrain has joined with uh, the Saudis and the US, of course, uh, to uh, create this catastrophic situation in Yemen. And in fact, has bragged that, uh, that Bahrain uh, used the uh, US made F-16s that it bought to conduct over 3,500 sorties, meaning bombing raids uh, in, in Yemen. Uh, there is a close military relationship with uh, Bahrain, a tiny country that doesn't need to spend uh, uh, its money on, on weapons, uh, but is doing so. And 85% of those weapons come from the United States. Uh, there is um, uh, also US military not only selling weapons, but providing assistance to Bahrain in buying those weapons. Uh, with foreign military financing, uh, with actual grants that come out of a disgusting program called the Excess Defense Articles, which some of you might know uh, sounds very much like the 1033 program in the United States where local police stations get excess uh, Pentagon uh, equipment. Um, and the, um, during the Obama years, uh, as, as uh, Hussein said, there were some attempts by Congress and by the Obama administration to put a hold on some of these weapon sales. Uh, but eventually those holds were lifted. And under Trump, uh, there's no pretense of having any kind of conditions. Uh, even when Congress tried to put some conditions, uh, Trump lifted them. And in his May 2017 visit to the region, uh, stopped in Bahrain to assure uh, the leaders of Bahrain that the U.S. relations would be, quote, free of the stain uh, that existed under the Obama years when there was some minimal attempt to uh, put some conditions for uh, human rights. Um, also under Trump, we saw in his last month of office where Bahrain um, also obliged Trump in formalizing its relations with Israel in, quote, a peace treaty right after the United Arab Emirates did it, uh, and then put it put in its, its bid for more weapons, uh, the Emirates did, and we're waiting to see the bid that, that Bahrain is going to put in uh, as a uh, compensation for the, quote, peace treaty. Um, Bahrain was also applauding Trump in leaving uh, the Iran nuclear deal known as the JCPOA. Uh, so you can see Bahrain and the Saudis um, really siding with the US uh, in this war against constant uh, war against um, uh, Iran and in the conflicts that are plaguing the region. So I just wanna end by saying uh, that the US government has been complicit in supporting shoring up uh, the Bahraini regime. The Bahraini regime has been complicit uh, in the US interventions in the region. And it's this complicity uh, that we have to break. We have a new administration in, uh, we have uh, much more of a, of, a, um, uh, of a base 
uh, for anti-war activism than we had under the Obama years when Obama came in and people were afraid to protest against the policies of the first uh, African-American we had in uh, the presidency. Uh, that doesn't exist this time around. People are all too happy to uh, put pressure on Biden uh, to change US policies. And so we have to do precisely what Ali uh, told us to do, which is stop the US from intervening. And you know, we have this problem of the fifth fleet and it's not a question of, oh, should the fifth fleet be moved to the Emirates or to Qatar or somewhere else? No, the fifth fleet should be abolished. We don't need a fifth fleet in the region. We don't need US intervention in the Middle East. We don't need the Middle East oil anymore. Um, what we need is peace in the region and the way uh, one good uh, e e effort on that road to peace would be to get the Biden administration uh, to stop the US interference in the affairs of Bahrain, to side with the Bahraini human rights activists, uh, the democracy activists in Bahrain and allow that movement to flourish so they can be a, a real democracy in Bahrain uh, without the U.S. interference. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Medea. Uh, extremely well done as always. Everybody's clapping, but they're muted. Um, our fourth and final terrific speaker uh, for this event, and then we will do our very best to get to all the wonderful questions that have already been pouring in in the chat. Uh, and uh, to anyone who, who's planning to hit raise hand, uh, our fourth speaker is Barbara Ween, who has worked to stop human rights abuses, violence, and war since she was 21, She, which was last year, I think. She has protected civilians from death squads using cutting edge peacekeeping methods and trained hundreds of foreign service officers, UN officials, humanitarian workers, police forces, soldiers, and grassroots leaders to de-escalate violence and armed conflicts. She has designed and taught countless peace seminars and trainings in 58 countries to end war. Barbara Ween, uh, take it away. I'm humbled to be on this seminar. Ali, my heart goes out to you and your father. And I thank everybody on this seminar for caring. Thank you for caring about this issue, about this country, about these people. What does it mean for the United States to be in bed with dictators and despots? Not just in Bahrain, but all over the world. 53 dictators around the world and authoritarian regimes, and they're all connected. Ali, thank you for naming the human rights activists and citizens of Bahrain who have been tortured, murdered, and imprisoned. Just like our movements here for Black Lives, we must always say their names. Say their names and keep them in the forefront of our minds. These regimes, that are repressing the human spirit all over the world are anachronistic, misogynistic, medieval, militaristic, and they're gonna go the way of the dinosaurs. This is the last gasp of patriarchal militaristic power. This is why they're trying to suppress civil society so much. What does it mean for the American flag to be in bed with these people. This is not what our country is supposed to represent. This is not in the long-term interest of the American public. This, we must take back our country, take back our relationship. We must wash the American flag of its sins. The whole relationship with these despots are upside down and they're on the wrong side of history. And as we know, nonviolent people power is rising all over the world through training, through discipline, through media skills, through movement building, through strategic planning. And we are all part of that global peace system, the rise of global civil society to end war, to end nationalism to replace flags with the Earth Day flag, with the world beyond war flag, 
we can change the course of human events. And we have, and we will. Somebody got up in Europe one day and said not who should be king, but whether there should be a king at all. And this began the demythologizing and demis demantling, dismantling of the divine right of kings. The Khalifi family is corrupt. The House of Saad is corrupt. They will go very soon. They will end. And I'm gonna share my screen with you if I have the ability to do so, Greta and David that the rise of nonviolent campaigns around the world is increasing exponentially. We saw it just, we could document pre-1901, then rising, then rising, all through the 80s, the 90s, and 749 nonviolent uprisings around the world last year. And with this, global protest tracker, we can see that in 2021, we have over 230 significant anti-government protests around, erupting around the world. 110 countries experiencing significant protests. 78% of authoritarian or authoritarian leaning countries have faced significant protests. Now, some of them are related to the pandemic, but more often they're related to the conditions these people are facing all over the world as Ali and Medea so profoundly laid out for us. This is the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And I want to make sure that we also give credit to the Global Nonviolent Action Database at Swarthmore College which has been tracking nonviolent struggles around the world. We are on the side of history that will win and will heal the planet and restore the human spirit, not through weapons, not through misogynistic, militaristic torture, but through people power all over the world. And this is what my students have been doing at AU. As many of you are aware, the atrium at American University School for International Service was named after Crown Prince Solomon bin Hamen bin Asa al Khalifi, who was an AU alumni, as was his father and his grandfather, through generous donations to the School for International Service. Well, my students didn't want to take this. They said, no, this is wrong, and they began early efforts to raise awareness about the human rights conditions in Bahrain, working with Bahraini activists like Hussein, um, like Medea in DC, their professors and uh, many non-governmental uh, organizations. They wrote online petitions. They wrote to the crown prince himself and they made it clear that we do not want the Khalifi money at AU and we want them to stop suppression of free speech. They invited the prince as an alumni to come to campus and have a dialogue with them. Of course, he declined. And that same ambassador that Medeas uh, uh, met with, uh, my students also tried to meet with and tried to present their petitions to. They planned events on campus. They showed the film Shouting in the Dark and we've never given up. We have 189 masters and PhD students and 248 undergrads studying peace and conflict resolution. And they're not going anywhere. We are graduating tens of thousands of young people around the world in peace studies programs. And they understand it is in the long-term interest of people to strengthen democratic and peaceful movements and the rule of law everywhere. This is what we must do. Instead of weapons sales and weapons exports, we must export nonviolence training. We must respond to repression with skills and de-escalate the repression all over the world. So we've only just begun. Um, we can turn this ship around. We've done it before, we'll do it again. And I really look forward to a discussion with all of you. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Barbara. I see people clapping. Uh, we will try to get through as many questions as possible uh, with answers from as many of our speakers as possible. Unfortunately, I believe Hussein has left, but Medea and Barbara and Ali are with us. Um, and, uh, and we'll try to take a question from the chat and then take one uh, from people with, uh, with the raise hand button pushed, uh, but even consolidating all the wonderful questions from the chat, I've got at least a dozen of them here. We'll never get to them all, but let's try this one first, uh, this collection of questions. Uh, how, does the, how does the presence of the US Naval fleet uh, relate to US behavior? Uh, doesn't the Fifth Fleet keep the Gulf open for commerce? What will happen without that? Uh, if the Fifth Fleet leaves, will China move in with its fleet? Um, what is the position of the political opposition in Bahrain on the presence uh, of the U.S. Navy there? What do the people of Bahrain think of it? Um, uh, and I would uh, and I would add, looking at the coverage in U.S. media, you would think that Russia was the one and only major hotbed of human rights abuses in the world. Uh, you don't hear about them in Bahrain. What does that have to do with the presence of the U.S. Navy in Bahrain? Who wants to speak to that first? Yeah, you want to it? Go ahead. I was saying Ali. Yeah. Oh, Ali, you want to go? Okay, uh, I'll try to uh, I'll try to answer shortly about I mean this uh, this question because uh, uh, I think we need time to to explain everything that the relation and the interests of the United States uh, to uh, in in Bahrain and the Gulf region, but uh, let me to say that or uh, as uh, as Biden said. Uh, you uh, always let me be very clear that uh, we don't want the United States to use our land for just only their uh, interests. So if they are, I mean, taking part of our land, they have to to uh, to be to make sure that they are their, uh, I mean, their, the, the fifth fleet of, for example, of United States is not against the people who live in their land, who, 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 who own that land. So United States uh, fifth fleet take the, the land and supporting dictatorship. And they are uh, like uh, 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 part of, um, or what can I say, is, we cannot reach, as, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, we cannot reach democracy because the intervene of, uh, of United States is supporting dictatorship. And they use just um, uh, excuse uh, when they mentioned Russia or, uh, or Iran or other, uh, other countries, uh, uh, as I, uh, in, in my opinion. But, uh, um, I, I want as well to uh, comment on this. Look, we we struggle from from ages, from hundred years, before uh, Iran become as a, uh, an Islamic republic. So before before Iran, we we were fighting for 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 our rights. So we don't want to discuss the the interest of of the United States. We we discuss our rights. Uh, to be to be free to have the freedom of speech to have a democracy um, uh, it's not it's my it's not my job i mean to discuss the interest of of united states i don't know if, if what i said is makes sense or uh, i hope uh, it's clear Barbara or Medea, Barbara, you want to speak briefly to this one too? Yeah, well, what does it say about international trade if we have to reinforce it through military might that's not trade um, th that seems like uh, you know economic coercion. Um, we should be strengthening civil society in those countries, in Russia, in China, so that we don't fear one another. We need to have global exchanges, foreign exchanges, Fulbrights, Peace Corps, whatever, 
um, student exchanges and with people power and citizen to citizen diplomacy and strengthening people uh, in Russia who are working for human rights, strengthening people in China working for human rights. We don't have to fear each other and we don't have to police the uh, sea lanes through military force in order to trade with each other. And I just add one thing, which is I think um, the U.S. is acting like a pirate on the high seas. Uh, we see the U.S. stopping Iranian shipments of oil in the high seas and selling that oil and then using the money as it wants. Uh, we see uh, shipments going to uh, Venezuela of Iranian boats that are stopped on the high seas. Um, the U.S. is a... Uh, is, um, part of the problem, certainly not part of the solution, and it acts um, like a dangerous uh, superpower that tries to manipulate other countries um, to its ends. And um, we should not have our ships uh, throughout the Persian Gulf, as Barbara says, uh, if countries want to sell us stuff, let them sell it to us. Uh, we don't need militaries to be able to artificially um, demand uh, other people's goods. So um, I love the way Barbara puts it in historic perspectives as, as this is, you know, uh, 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 Bahrain was part of the British colonial empire. And when it got, quote, liberated from that colonial empire in 1971, uh, it became part of the US neo-colonial empire. And it has to be liberated from that as well so that the people can liberate themselves. And having the fifth fleet there, having the uh, US Naval Forces Central Command there uh, stops it from, stops people from being liberated. Very well said. Greta, am I correct in thinking nobody has their hand raised? So I'll take another. I haven't seen any either. You can click um, participants and then click raise hand or click reactions and then hit raise hand. Or if you're on the phone, you can press star nine if you want to raise your hand. And if that's not working for anybody, explain to us what's wrong in the chat and we'll try. I to can't see it because Saeed Shihabi raised his hand. And I think it's very, uh, it's a good opportunity to hear from him because he's a prominent uh, uh, political uh, opposition. But he's raised his hand physically. No, he didn't use. I mean, yeah. can it, we hear from him? Is that, that is that Ash Mahad Dashwar you're talking about? Yes, Ash Mahad. Uh, yes, Ash. Yes, Ash. I'm trying uh, to. Uh, I'm asking him to unmute. Uh, Thank you. First of all, I'm uh, struggling to get my way through this my son's computer, so I'm not well averse to these uh, items. Uh, this is number one. I cannot even show my hand uh, on the participants list. I am so ignorant about computers. But just to tell you that uh, my first, uh, when I was doing my research in the 70s, I was doing computer control. But then I evolved into an ignorant person in computing. So I am not really that uh, well aware of it. However, I am from Bahrain also. I am a colleague of Hussein and Ali, and I am one of those who have been struggling against, against regime for many decades. Uh, so as Ali mentioned earlier, we were against the regime and we were asking for our rights much before the Iranian revolution. I was in the streets in 1965. Uh, calling at the time for the for the departure of the British at the time and also for some labor laws and as well as uh, constitutional uh, rights. Now, where do we go from there? One of the questions was, uh, what do you think of the United States uh, and their uh, military presence? In Bahrain, uh, of course, we have always had uh, those leftists in the 60s and 70s who were calling for the removal of all the bases from the Gulf. Now, if the United States proves to be a, friendly, a friend of the people of Bahrain, I'm sure there will always be ways of uh, negotiating uh, mutual agreements and mutual uh, interest. The problem at the moment is that our people see and view the military base as supporter of the regime. 
they view the, uh, the, the, the British naval base as a means of supporting this dictatorship. Uh, so unless this problem of uh, representation, civil rights, democratization, human rights, unless these issues are tackled seriously, and I hope Mr. Biden will do, uh, unless this is done, uh, the people will just have uh, will have an ambivalent relationship with uh, with uh, with uh, the United States and with the West. I do not know why America and Britain, and specifically, do not and are not now for the past 30 years since the Soviet Union the, the, the demise and the fragmentation in 1990. I don't know why they have abandoned both. Uh, that the pillars of the Western uh, doctrine, that is democratization and the human rights. So I hope that with this large number of people attending here, they will participate in making the United States a force for good. A force for good, it can only be if it really supports those people uh, in the third world, especially in the Gulf, uh, to, to gain their rights. And I believe that if these rights are guaranteed and are secured, then I, the world will be a more peaceful place. We'll have more peace with democracy. We have less peace with dictatorship. We only we saw how the terrorists emerged from Arabian Peninsula. Why? Because they are pushed to the limit. People are pushed to take extre extreme measures to defend themselves and to ensure that they exist. So I hope that the United States will now, under the Democrats, under Mr. Biden, will start a new, a new chapter in the world. We cannot continue to live in Saudi Arabia or in Bahrain when our women are behind bars, are raped behind bars, are raped. And uh, I just want to direct the attention of uh, the participants to, and that, this is my last point, to the uh, documentary by the BBC less than a year ago in April uh, last year, called Breaking the Silence, Breaking the Silence. And then you will see the testimony of two women who will openly, uh, and they are Arab Muslim women with a veil, and they will tell you how they were sexually assaulted behind bars. This is in a country which is a special ally for Britain and for the United States. I hope there will, uh, your effort, your uh, contribution will make a difference to our lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe I should take the, the next set of questions from the chat. Uh, here's a question from, from Stephen Zunis. Uh, Biden promised that he would stop cozying up to dictators uh, as if this were somehow a Trumpian phenomenon, not the standard uh, practice of the US government for uh, years and years and years uh, of the, I would note that of the 50 most oppressive governments uh, on the planet by the US government's own definition, 96% of them are armed and or trained and or funded by the US military. Uh, and this related question, what should the Biden administration do uh, to follow through on that? And what should we be able to use that statement to do? Uh, should assets be frozen? Should there be sanctions? Uh, should, I think the best answer has already been given, get the US military out. What, what, should, uh, what should be done? Uh, go ahead, Barbara. And well, first of all, we still have a semblance of democracy in the United States. So you all have a voice. I have a voice. We have a voice. Put pressure on your elected officials. It begins by picking up the phone and calling your senators and congresspeople to say, stop U.S. arms sales abroad. Not just just to Bahrain, but to all these regimes that David has mentioned. Is that really how we want to be remembered in history? Those are our tax dollars. That's our hard earned money. And look at the need at home. And the awareness is growing around this with, with the pandemic that so many people uh, want uh, us to stop the evictions, to give um, uh, pandemic relief, uh, to vaccinate the poor and the elderly and others. So use the money to restore human security at home and stop arms sales to all these despotic regimes. But we also need to ban the Bahraini royal family from entering the United States. They should be put on a no-fly list. Um, and our programs should be aiding the civil society. 
And I refer all of you to the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict that has put out wonderful reports about the responsibility to support civil society. Um, foreign aid should be always contingent on human rights. Um, and uh, we do have allies, by the way, that none of us have mentioned in Congress, people like uh, 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 Senator Casey from Pennsylvania. Um, we have people like Dennis Blair. All of these uh, people have spoken out. Dennis Blair used to be the central commander of the Fifth Fleet in the Persian Gulf. And he said, we only recently moved the Fifth Fleet to Bahrain. Um, in uh, in uh, recent decades, um, that it, that doesn't have to be based there, uh, if at all. I mean, I'd like to see it go away completely. He was talking about putting it back on a flagship. Um, there are many many alternatives. We need economic strategies, political strategies, social strategies, um, and we know from Jean Sharp's work, the preeminent nonviolent scholar that there's hundreds of strategies we can be using. But it starts with us. Pick up the phone, call your elected officials, tell them what you feel of that we do not want to be arming dictators around the world. Very well said. Uh, if nobody else wants to pick that up, Greta, is there a raised hand you want to go to? And, and I would it note that that, that people are recommending that a former member of parliament from Bahrain, Matar Matar, who is on the call, uh, be asked to speak. So I would encourage him to uh, raise his hand as well. Okay, let's go to Odile, who has her hand up. Um, Odile, you can now unmute. Odile, you need to unmute. There you go. Okay. I wanted to say that some of us had been working on a weapon of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East. Would it be time again now to restart a conference before so many arms and nuclear weapons are being sold in the region? Anybody want to speak to that? Sold or developed? Anyone want to address that, Medea? You address that, David. <laughs> uh, I, I think it should be a, a project we all work on, and it should be the topic of the next uh, webinar. Um, Great. <laughs> uh, uh, Matar, Matar, if you would like to, to speak uh, next, please raise your hand. Uh, otherwise, Greta, if you can see if you can find him, I'm unable in the, in the vast number of people. Um, let me jump to the next uh, set of questions from the chat. We've got so many. Uh, is the British CID still in charge in Bahrain? Can you give us more details about the ruling family? Who are they? Um, will the passing of the prime minister change policies in Bahrain? Anyone want to speak to those questions? Well, just on the details of the royal family, they have hired 11 public relations firms on K Street, which is another area where we can put uh, pressure. Um, so just like Medea, when my husband was invited to a fancy dinner at the Bahraini embassy with uh, his nonprofit organization, Freedom House, and they rolled out a huge propaganda campaign against the uh, a film Shouting in the Dark. Um, it, there were all these K Street lobbyists and uh, expensive suits there in the room, you know, swirling uh, drinks and eating whatever caviar. Uh, fortunately, my husband stood up and called them out on their propaganda and all of the m massive amount of money they're spending on lobbyists. So um, we have published a list of those K Street lobby firms, PR firms, and be prepared. They will launch disinformation campaigns against you, as someone said in the chat box, um, when they went on marches in 2011 against the destruction of Pearl Roundabout. Uh, they got hate um, uh, media from Bahrain and from others. Uh, we have been uh, seeing this for criticizing the king in Morocco recently as well. The same public relations machines start gearing up. Um, the truth is on our side and you can't suppress the truth. 
Um, so uh, that's one way that we can be working to reveal uh, what the real Khalifi family is doing um, by hiring, um, you know, these hired guns uh, to spin uh, what they're doing to their people. Might have missed the last second or so there, Barbara, as you muted yourself. Uh, did Medea or Ali want to speak to that or should I take the next question? Maybe Ali could speak to us about the difference between the uh, Khalifa and King Hamid. Well, Khal Khalifa, uh, he's in, uh, in his uh, position from uh, around 50 years. He, I mean, before even Bahrain get independent in the in in 70s, he was in the in the same position as a prime minister. The, Unfortunately, in our country, the ruler cannot change unless he passed away. So no one, no one changed. He just wait uh, when when his uh, day comes. Uh, I want to uh, comment about um, uh, the UK uh, government or UK CIA. Yeah, we. I think the main supporter to, I mean, beside the United States is uh, is a Britain, United United Kingdom. They they support the Bahraini government by technical assistance and and even I mean the the system inside the prison is very similar to what happened uh, to. It's it's very similar to the the UK uh, system. Uh, they train the police, they train the uh, embossment uh, uh, but, but is a side body. And uh, what we see from the, from the foreign office of the British government, they try to avoid uh, condemn any uh, human rights violence, violence in Bahrain. I mean, compared with the, with the United States, Sometimes we hear from from uh, the uh, foreign affairs uh, some comment, or they demand, and uh, sometimes to to release the prominent human rights defender. But in in UK, they try to avoid uh, mentioned uh, Bahrain with the, uh, I mean mentioned Bahrain when it comes to the human rights uh, violence. But uh, uh, beside that, uh, as well. Uh, uh, just uh, three years ago, the uh, uh, British naval base established established naval base in Bahrain. So in Bahrain, as a small island, a small country, is not more than 600 kilometers square, very small uh, population, we have international uh, military base. We have fifth, the fifth fleet of United States naval base. We have the Saudi military, Saudi military, they have uh, military base as well, the UAE and, uh, uh, and Al Khalifa, I mean, military, which is uh, most of the members of the, the, uh, the Bahraini military are mercenaries from, from different uh, countries. Um, they are not uh, original uh, Bahraini, uh, Bahraini original. Uh, can I add something to that? Because um, that was something that shocked me totally when I was in Bahrain, uh, that the people who were doing the arresting and the interrogating uh, weren't even Bahrainis. Uh, they were uh, Sunnis brought in from Pakistan and other countries. And in fact, the ones interrogating us, um, they didn't speak Arabic. So they were happy to interrogate us uh, in, in English. Um, so you get a police force that's totally separate from the uh, population that have no allegiance to the population and their allegiance is only to the regime. And uh, I also want to mention that the U.S. should stop the, quote, training of the military in the United States. Um, keep in mind, always we keep saying what a tiny country Bahrain is, but there have been close to a thousand uh, U.S. military, uh, Bahraini military that have been trained in the United States. Uh, so that's one program I think we should try to get stopped. The U.S. also sent a top abusive uh, police officer over there to train the Bahraini police force. Uh, that's right. Do you want to go to a raised hand up? I think one just vanished, as I said that. 
Yeah, I see Barb and Roy. Um, Barb and Roy, you can unmute if you'd like to ask your question. Uh, yes, my husband and I lived in Bahrain for five years in the 80s. He was in charge of primary health for the country, upping the standards. What I would like to address, and we loved it there. We, we had a wonderful time. But what I'd like to address is the situation with this so-called peace deal with Israel. What I understand and what I read is that they had to agree to buying our weapons and our military planes or their regimes would be overthrown. I, at first, the king of Bahrain rejected that and I wrote him a letter and I thanked him and I said, thank you for standing up for this. But a week later, it, he had changed his mind according to the news and he agreed to it. So they had, like you say, they had to spend all this money, this little nation, along with UAE, and there's about three other nations, to buy all these weapons when the money should have been spent on the people or other things, but they had they they were threatened and they had to agree to this or they they would be overthrown. Can you address that, somebody? Who wants to speak to that? Is that true? Is that documented? I was not aware of that, but it doesn't surprise me at all. And the same is true with Israel. 70% of all U.S. weapons sales to Israel, or grants rather, must come back in the form of contracts to U.S. corporations, one of which has now just been appointed to the board of American University. Um, a big weapons dealer is now on our board, much to my shock and horror. So this is a, a revolving door that uh, they have set up with the military industrial complex, not just with Bahrain, um, but with other uh, countries as well, that it had the largesse must come back to our Beltway bandits, Lockheed Martin, McDonnell Douglas, all the big weapons dealers. Um, when they coerce other countries into these um, arrangements, uh, there are profits involved for uh, domestic uh, corporations here, which of course give huge amounts of money to people to get reelected. Um, this is the Iron Triangle. Ali, did you want to speak to that as well? Uh, well, I think Bahrain, uh, they don't have the Al Khalifa uh, regime, they don't have independent uh, decision or uh, they, they cannot decide in, in Bahrain. They receive financial support from Saudi Arabia and UAE. So uh, I think the, the, the foreign policy, they, the Saudi and, and UAE use Bahrain for the foreign policy, uses as, uh, I mean, trial, uh, uh, the, the reaction when they, when they made uh, or normalized uh, the relation with Israel, or even when they buy uh, weapons from, from uh, United States. So that's why we say, we say, or we believe that, uh, that Bahrain can change by just order, by, 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 by telephone from, from uh, from Mr. Mr. Biden, as I, as I mentioned earlier, in Bahrain, the small country, we have like maybe five international or foreign uh, uh, military: you, the Fifth Fleet, the Naval Base, the Saudi Arabia uh, uh, military, the United Arab uh, Emirates, and the mercenaries, uh, where the where, what they call the Bahrain um, military. So. Uh, Yes, I, I think I think the the the, the uh, this decision came um, in agreement with United Arab Emirates and uh, Saudi Arabia. Going to the next set of questions from the chat, we have so many to try to get to. Um, Will there be, does, do, are there expectations that there may soon be an uprising on the scale of that of 10 years ago? Um, how can U.S. activists build solidarity with Bahraini activists? Um, is there a, a, a good strategy for taking on U.S. corporate sponsored events, uh, celebrity participated uh, events, uh, et cetera, for, for boycotts? Um, there is, uh, 
there's an account uh, in the chat uh, by someone who's on the call with us today of having participated in a protest in Washington, D.C. 10 years ago uh, and having uh, gotten lots of attention from Bahrain and, and threatening phone calls uh, from Bahrain, et cetera. Um, and, and I would mention in connection with all these questions, I posted in the chat a link to the peace pledge at World Beyond War that people have signed in 189 countries, but not yet a single person from Bahrain. I don't want anyone to sign it if that endangers them, uh, but I would love if someone, perhaps Bahraini outside of Bahrain uh, were able to sign that. Anyone wanna take on any of those questions? Don't be shy. Yeah, I tried to address it a little bit before that when that person was participating in the protest, they then started to get attacked online. And um, that are, you know, are the bots and the troll farms and the public relations firms. Um, and uh, we need to expose them and out them. Um, I will say that many of these authoritarian regimes actually attempt to project more power than they really enjoy. Uh, so for instance, 46% of all of Trump's Twitter followers were bots. The same is true for Putin. Um, so uh, they actually try to amplify their power and that's a sign of insecurity. Um, so uh, when that person was attacked online, it means that we're winning. It means that they're, they fear us. And I didn't catch all the other questions you were seeking. Well, uh, I would like to go. Oh, sorry. No, I would like to hear from Ali uh, the response to that question of, you know, uh, what are the uh, conditions in terms of uh, uh, people's uprisings again? Because I understand that with the price of oil being low and with the pandemic uh, that has it, it also stopped uh, visitors and, and a lot of the money coming into Bahrain is from visitors, uh, the economic situation is bad there. And uh, I know it's hard for people to rise up during a pandemic as well, um, but what do you think uh, in, in terms of how people are feeling towards the government these days? It's not easy. I mean, it's, it's, of course, it's not easy to take a place, I mean, in the street and go for, I mean, with the a big uh, protest, but the, but the protest is still ongoing. I mean, today and yesterday and the day before. And not only this, uh, two days ago, uh, children were arrested in, in, in age uh, between 13 and 15. Uh, and uh, still the people write houses in different uh, places in Bahrain, just to make sure that on 14th of uh, no one can take place and, and go and, and protest. Uh, uh, in the street. Of course, the, because of the pandemic, it's not uh, easy as well, I mean, to make a uh, big protest. Uh, Besides that, the, the police everywhere now, and they use camera checkpoints, uh, threatening people direct and indirectly uh, to, not take, uh, to not take place. No one can be protected if it's, if it's uh, I mean, scholars or uh, teachers or, or doctors, uh, old people or young people. So we live in fear, uh, in a fear. I mean, they want to be able to be scared to, from uh, going out and uh, raise their demands. But uh, the, str the struggle uh, continue. And I think uh, the Bahraini people, they are still brave uh, and, and taking place even, I mean, uh, they attacked uh, uh, by the police. <clears throat> Jumping to another question uh, from Stephen Zunis, Dennis Ross criticized Iraq. This is a US uh, State Department and National Security Council official. Dennis Ross criticized Iran, but not Bahrain uh, during the Obama presidency, while another Obama National Security Council member supported democracy uh, activism in Bahrain. There were mixed uh, views. Who, who is now in the Biden administration and what is the, the mixture of conflicting views among officials uh, in the Biden administration on Bahrain? Uh, a related question, perhaps, uh, is Iran behind this? I 
your guess is as good as mine what the this is, but is Iran behind it? Uh, anybody want to take a... I, I, I would uh, comment by maybe three, three points. Fair, firstly, uh, we uh, fight for our rights before Iran become an uh, Islamic Republic. So maybe and we have struggling for 100 years demanding for reform, for democracy, uh, and ex freedom of, of speech. This is uh, fa first one. Uh, the the, sec the second uh, point, I was myself, I was in a prison when I was 15 years old in 19. I still remember all details. I just mentioned uh, seven uh, children were arrested two days ago, age and age uh, between age uh, 13 and 15. What is the relation? I can ask what is the relation between uh, uh, arresting uh, children with the Iran uh, interfering? Uh, third, third point, what we have in Bahrain, we have f the fifth fleet of the United States, the naval base, the Saudi, uh, uh, the Saudi troops, the UAA. This is the fact. This is the fact where we can see the intervention is from United States and the United Kingdom and Saudi Arabia. Who said that Iran interfering uh, I ask him to show any, to, to give us any uh, evidence. The last point, when we have democracy, no one can interfere, interfere, uh, I mean, uh, interfere in, in Bahrain. So when we can express our uh, uh, opinion, when we have democratic system, no one can interfere. Not so Saudi Arabia not will will not interfere, and United and Arab United Emirates and and Iran and others because we will govern by by law. Now we don't have law. We don't have democracy. What we have, have absolute uh, monarchy. Uh, what what we want we want to be as a human being uh, uh, like like the people in United States and United Kingdom and and Western they can they they can express their their opinion they can practice their religion they they can uh, uh, I mean govern them themselves by uh, by the uh, by by the parliament and this is will not benefit the Iran or or Iran. Can I respond to the um, Biden issue? Sure. Um, so I think it's very much uh, the same situation as under Obama in terms of who's on the inside and the division that we saw within Obama. Well, let's put some conditions on. Let's hold this little bit of aid, but let's give them this. I mean, that's kind of what we're going to see uh, uh, when you look at uh, Anthony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, Biden himself. Uh, you know, they come out of the Obama administration in that same kind of mindset of let's keep this quote stability of these dictatorships who are our friends. Uh, they will be better towards Iran, and we're hoping that they get back in the Iran nuclear deal, but they're taking way too long and putting conditions, which is dangerous. Um, and they are going to have more of an emphasis on human rights, and the um, government of Bahrain will want to throw some bones out there to please uh, the, the Biden people. We already see that happening in Saudi Arabia with the release of the uh, very important women rights activist, Lujain al uh, uh that just happened two days ago. Um, so those uh, divisions will continue to exist. What's different is um, that we have a stronger movement than we had under Obama, that we are now saying no weapon sales to Saudi Arabia for the war in Yemen. We are saying put a hold on the weapon sales to the United Arab Emirates. We have to say the same thing in, in terms of Bahrain. We have some more radical people inside the Congress who will back us up. So I think the difference is there uh, of the grassroots um, that we are stronger this time around and we have to prove to the people of Bahrain that we can uh, accomplish uh, some uh, uh, progress in terms of stopping our government from uh, supporting the Khalifa uh, regime in terms of demanding the release of important uh, uh, activists such as Ali's father and in uh, supporting the democracy movement. We're, yes, we're at a I, oh, I just wanted to add that um, all of these people are in the iron cage of war. 
they're trapped in a straitjacket, and it's up to us to dismantle the pillars upholding war. It's up to us to erode the pillars of support for the war system. You can talk about this official and this NSA member and um, you know this council or that council. We have to take on a structural analysis and take on the system itself. All of these people are in the national security straitjacket and only nonviolent movements will be able to cut the strings of that straitjacket and erode the iron cage of war. As we're past our stopping point at 11.30, if I could pull maybe just two more questions out of the pile and then get uh, closing brief comments from uh, our three speakers who are with us, uh, I think that would be uh, terrific. Want to respect people's time, at least somewhat. Um, one, one question uh, that came up, uh, what, what is with all this crazy talk of the U.S. shifting to doing good things in Bahrain? Isn't the best thing the U.S. could do to simply get out entirely uh, from Bahrain? And a related question. Question and going to topic Medea was just on. Uh, what about ending weapon sales to the entire region? Um, what about Congresswoman Ilhan Omar's uh, legislation, stop arming human rights abusers? I don't know how you use weapons of war without abusing human rights, but in any case, what about, uh, what about a larger uh, scale uh, shift away from being the world's weapons dealer uh, for the US State Department. Uh, those are any other questions or thoughts that have come up in the past 90 minutes. Uh, who wants to go first? Well, um, uh, human rights um, first and um, many other human rights groups have tried to expose the atrocity supply chain um, not just the weapons dealers, but also the other corporations that might be uh, sponsoring mercenaries in certain areas of the world, supplying the, the bolts, the minerals, the, you know, the um, uh, resources, underlying resources for the production of weapons. Um, so there are human rights groups that set up stoptheatrocitysupplychain.org um, to expose exactly who the enablers are. Um, and I think we should be working with elected officials, um, progressives and enlightened, forward-looking young people um, in Congress and in parliaments around the world uh, to expose exactly what's going on with the atrocity supply chain. And then we, through our purchasing power, boycott, sanction, and divest. This is what the Native Americans did with the pipelines. They exposed the top banks um, through the defund the Dakota Access Pipeline. And they put up a beautiful website about exactly who was funding these oil pipelines. And then they moved $43 million out of those banks in pension funds, individual accounts. We have the power to do this. We can um, out who is providing the weapons. Medea or Ali, any closing remarks? Uh, I don't have uh, many to ask, but uh, uh, I just want to say that uh, we believe in people. We believe in the human rights uh, uh, defenders, the freedom lovers. I think uh, we hear from now uh, United States inside the, the American people we believe that you can make uh, some change by uh, uh, by uh, supporting us for this for this campaign, especially because uh, the new administration, Mr. Biden, uh, uh, he said many things about human rights, uh, especially in our region. He mentioned Saudi Arabia. He mentioned the war uh, on Yemen. I think Bahrain is. Very simple compared with the, with the, with the Yemen and the, uh, and and Saudi Arabia, and we believe that if he just make like a call to the King of Bahrain, many things will change. Uh, I will repeat what uh, Barbara said: uh, stop arming the Bahraini, uh, stop supporting politically the Bahraini stop training the police uh, if there is no uh, uh, result with improving the human rights situation in, inside Bahrain. 
I think from United States we can uh, we can make uh, we can make change uh, if they if they respect the principles and values they talking about uh, every day and uh, always all the time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Medea. Any closing remark? Well, when I was in Bahrain uh, and was picking up the canisters of the tear gas uh, and seeing that every one of them had a marking saying made in the United States, uh, it just broke my heart. And seeing the bravery of the Bahraini people who were facing the US weapons while the US manufacturers were getting wealthy off of uh, their um, uh, misery, uh, is a terrible indictment of the war economy that we have. So I just want to leave saying that I'm very excited that we're working with World Beyond War in the campaign to divest from the war machine. And you can go to the uh, website divestfromwarmachine.org. And we are asking our Congress people to stop taking money uh, from their, for their campaigns from the war machine and to divest themselves personally from the war machine. And it's a very important campaign that we do. Uh, and I invite you all to uh, join us in that. So we can either work with World Beyond War, Divest from the War Machine, Code Pink, all of us working together uh, to say that it's not only the companies that make these weapons that profit, it's also our own officials who take the money from these companies uh, for their election campaigns and then turn around and tell us it's about jobs and that we can't close these weapons factories because workers would lose their jobs. Now during a pandemic, I think we understand that our military can't help us in the crises that we face, whether it's the healthcare crises, the crises of white supremacy, the climate crises, none of this uh, will be helped with the war machine. So it's our job to dismantle the war machine. Thank you. Very well said. Uh, people, again, are cheering as they have been throughout, uh, but they are muted. Thank you very, very much to Hussein Abdullah, no longer with us on the call, but uh, his organization is Americans for Democracy and Human Rights in Bahrain. Uh, thank you to Ali Mushaima, to Medea Benjamin, to Barbara Ween. Uh, incredibly well done, all of you. Thank you to Greta Zaro for- Thank you, Medea. Thank you, Barbara, for- very power speech. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be with you, Ali. Thank, thank you, you, Ali. Keep up the great work. Uh, thank you again to Greta Zaro for helping out uh, with this call. It will be on World Beyond on YouTube.com slash World Beyond War and on WorldBeyondWar.org. Uh, someone who just put in the chat to me, give me five things we can do in the United States. Uh, I would go to, to Hussein's organization and support it, uh, Americans for Democracy and Human Rights in Bahrain. I would do everything Medea just said. Uh, I would share this video with everyone you can. I would call Congress. Uh, I would join or start a chapter of World Beyond War at worldbeyondwar.org. Uh, and if you want six things, uh, get my book called 20 dictators supported by the United States. So one of them happens to live in Bahrain. Uh, thank you all very, very much for being here. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.